First patient is a 47 year old male, fell from a ladder onto his left hip with this left acetabulum fracture. It was non displaced. A CT scan was obtained. Due to the congruity, uh, he was managed non operatively and made toe touch weight bearing on that extremity and was discharged on DUT prophylaxis. Next patient is a 75 year old female who opened the door into her face and fell backwards. She has a right pubic rami fracture. Uh, she was nerve intact and of note, she did have an old LC1 pelvis on the left and she was made <clears throat> uh, weight bearing is tolerated. Uh, next patient is a 35 year old female uh, who works at Costco when a forklift pinched her foot between um, a shelf she has this left gray toe P1 fracture as well as a fourth P2 fracture. She was put into a hard sole shoe um, and she will follow up in the office this week. Next patient is a 33 year old male. Uh, we were consulted for a wound check on him for the ED. Uh, he dropped a pipe on his hand three days prior and suffered you know, index finger and ring finger distal lacerations that were about one centimeter and sutured by the ED and washed out. And then three days later, they called us uh, for this non-displaced right small finger P2 fracture. He was buddy tape for comfort. Next patient is an 18 year old male. Um, the story was that he was at high school wood shop class when his hand got put into some sort of chainsaw. He suffered uh, multiple finger lacerations superficially and then a uh, partial amp on a small finger. Um, of note, the radial digital neurovascular bundle was cut on the small finger, uh, and he also had no extension at the IP joint. He was washed out and sutured, and then the patient actually ended up leaving and then coming back uh, for a psych consultation because there was concern that this was non-accidental, uh, and he is currently being managed in the hospital. Good morning. First patient is a 75 year old female, status post fall, a left bimal ankle fracture dislocation. Was initially closed reduced, placed in short AO splints, and taken for uh, ORIF. Next patient is a 48 year old male, status post MVC, a left distal radius fracture and left clavicle fracture. Clavicle was treated with a sling. This radius was closed reduced and placed in sugar tongue splint. Next is a 14. Jason, what else did he have besides a distal radius fracture? Uh, he also had a, like the ulnar um, style. The, the end of the ulna was uh, disrupted as well. And where in the, where in the ulna was the fracture? Uh, right there. So it, was, <laughs> it wasn't just an ulnar styloid, right? Yeah. There you go. So that may instruct you that you wish to consider operative intervention here just because of the severity of the injury. Correct. What about the clavicle makes you concerned for something else? Is this typically what a cl clavicle fracture will look like when you get an x-ray? Um, I think there's a little bit more uh, space between the fragments than usually. So it's distracted and it's a high energy mechanism. What else do, would you wanna look for or evaluate for? So with like a high energy clavicle fracture, you'd be worried about like, a, like rib fractures, uh, maybe like scapula. Uh, brachial plexus, 
Okay. Was he neurovascularly intact? He was. And you were able to get an exam with the distal, uh, well, it's actually a bone bone fracture. Uh, yes, I was able to get an exam. He was neurovascularly intact. Uh, next is a 14 year old male status post fall with the left open both bone forearm fracture. It was a one millimeter poke hole on the volar side. Uh, he was closed, reduced, and placed in sugar tongue splint. Um, also, would be a watcher for a close follow up. Um, he was sent out. And the antibiotics given were what? Uh, he got ANSEF in the ED, and then uh, we'll be given uh, Keflex. Uh, outpatient. Uh, that's, we... Is that typical with the open ones in pediatrics? Uh, so with uh, type one open pediatric fractures, uh, I believe there's some literature to say that uh, the outcomes in terms of infections and complications are similar with non-operative management and uh, IV antibiotics in the ED with uh, operative washout. It takes a long time to get used to this idea, but that is what people are doing now. Mm -hmm. But it has to be it has to be a pinhole opening. It can't be a high energy mechanism, and you really have to consider what the injury is underneath and whether you can maintain a stable reduction. If you're going to have a hard time maintaining the reduction and you're going to go to the OR anyway, if you're going to think you're going to need to, then you probably still should wash it out. But that one is one I would consider doing what you did here. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next is a 33-year-old male uh, with uh, cerebral palsy. He stepped on an object and rotated his foot awkwardly uh, with left third through fifth metatarsal neck fractures. Minimally displaced, he was placed in a hard sole shoe. Good morning, everyone. First, we have a 10 year old male, so that's supposed cartwheel with this left, both bone forearm fracture. It's closed, reduced in the ED, uh, placed into a sugar tongue splint. Uh, next, we have a 10 year old female, so that's supposed to ground level fall. She's staying its right pathologic subtrope femur fracture. After work up here uh, in the emergency, she's provisionally splinted, worked up here in the, in the uh, hospital uh, MRI, so that she had um, lesions consistent with fibrous dysplasia, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. And so she was uh, transferred up to uh, Newark for definitive care. So what really happened with her is our own PEDS team contacted Kathleen Beebe themselves and kind of went around us so they were kind of already in the process of being transferred up there before the MRI was even obtained to see what kind of lesion it was. Looks like it's probably just polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. Uh, and then what's interesting is that she ended up getting transferred up there and then apparently was very unhappy with the floor care at Newark. And then the following morning demanded to be trans transferred to CHOP. So this patient got transferred four times, I think, three or four times. I think they were transferred to our institution uh, right. yeah. before receiving uh, before receiving care. So I think the take home point with this one. So Kathleen Beebe does come to our institution. She has privileges here. So I think the take home here, I've had a, a conversation with her regarding this patient too, is our pathology department. So she still doesn't feel comfortable with our pathology department and reading frozen sections. Uh, and felt more comfortable just doing a frozen at her home, home institution and then treating this. So we're in the process of working with our pathology department to be able to do a true musculoskeletal frozen section that's trustworthy. Uh, and then these cases can be done together with our PEDS ortho department here and Kathleen Beebe. 
Joe, Joe Moore, how would, how would you manage the fracture? Let's say the patient did stay in our institution. Sure. Um, uh, you know, you could do pediatrics in kids with femur fractures per age or weight. You could consider internal fixation, flexible nailing. You could do um, plating as well. You know, I talked about this with Dr. Uh, Dr. Adolfson and, um, you know, the sort of after going up, going on about it, for, we spoke about it for, for a little while and, and ultimately he came up with the idea that probably in this case that flexible nailing is the right, the right, the right choice for her. Yeah, go back to your uh, images, go back to your x-rays. So is it just one lesion? No, 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 it's, uh, it's probably, it's all the way, I mean, it's probably best seen on the MRI, it's right. all the way through the. So it's the, through, uh, it's through one of the lesions. Yep. And there's a pretty concerning lesion. I don't know if it showed through there very well, but in kind of the inner troch, subtroch area, just above it too. Yeah. And then there's a distal yep. lesion as well. So I think you definitely would err on something intramedullary here. Uh, I think flexi nails is a decent option. I think it's more of a, this is an ismic fracture, not really a subtroch fracture. So I kind of call it a proximal shaft fracture. So I think it's okay to consider flexi nails. Uh, I probably would supplement it with a one-legged spica for a few weeks, uh, just for comfort. And then I'm first added, you know, stability and then take the spike off in the office after three weeks. Uh, I think this is also one where you could consider doing a rigid, you know, rigid lateral troke nail if she were big enough for the seven millimeter uh, orthopediatrics lateral troke nail, that might be actually a good indication in this case, just to span all of those, uh, all of those lesions. And does anything have to be done at the lesion itself or can all this be done, you know, through incisions on the front and the back? Yeah, I don't know that, that I don't know that anything needs to be done at the, at the lesion. Um, if you're, if you're suggesting like, it's like a curatage and that kind of stuff, uh, uh, you know, one one paper I read on this showed that <clears throat> most of most of curataging and bone grafting ends up getting resorbed, and um, it gets replaced with the same kind of weak woven uh, immature bone. So it's not, uh, especially in the poly polyostatic cases. Yeah, I think it's a good question, Brian. I think uh, I think Dr. Beebe wanted to have some type of path just to prove the diagnosis before putting something in there. So I'm not sure would she's ruling that out of going back at some point and. And bone grafting that because I know when it is a single lesion through a fibrous dysplasia, some of us will consider curataging that, and you know, and grafting it if it's a uh, if it's in a femur too. Maybe not right away though. Thanks, thanks guys. Uh, next is a 13 year old male. Uh, he still his toe playing soccer. It's right great toe P2 fracture. He's made weight bearing is tolerated in the arch of shoe. Next is a 90 year old male found down, uh, uh, found to have this right uh, posterior ilium uh, fracture. Uh, it didn't, didn't appear to affect the rest of the pelvic ring. So he's made uh, weight bearing is tolerated. Next is a 61 year old female, says was ground will fall. He has this right patella fracture. She had this right patella fracture. She was able to straight leg raise. She was made weight bearing and extension with a bulky knee immobilizer. She'll follow up in the office. <clears throat> Next is a, pardon me, 71 year old female found down with this left to be a shaft fracture. Note, um, this patient has uh, dementia, diabetes, ESRD. Uh, she has a 90 degree flexion contracture. She's not ambulatory. She's a seizure with uh, residual left-sided weakness and, sub and the subsequent contractures. And she also has a seizure subsequent to the, the CVA. And so the decision was made to pursue non-operative management for this patient. She was placed provisionally in a, in a short leg splint um, because of the contracture uh, at the knee, the 90 degree contra flexion contracture, a well padded short leg splint. So your concern for non-operative treatment here was from what specifically that she was a high risk for anesthesia? Yeah, so she's you know she's a high risk for anesthesia. She's um, she's non-ambulatory and, and non-verbal. So I think that you know 
combined with the fact that, yeah, yes. I mean, if we uh, should have a discussion because it would be hard to, I mean, managing a cast versus a sprint is, is a, you have to see her almost every week. Right. Make sure that it's still okay. It's there's just more care on your part. Not that it's wrong. It's just it's a. Whereas if you put a nail, sometimes it'll disappear for two months and it'll, it'll be fine. It's true. It's you don't true. have to worry about it. So it's a kind of you have to weigh those options. It's true. Thank you. A uh, question from the crowd was if I could get a nail, if you could probably get a nail with a 90 degree flexion contraction. I know probably not. So maybe if you go in for patellar, but um, you could probably, probably also plate it. So and then, of course, well, there's what are your, in your well, what are your entry point options? Sure. So you can see I'm thinking super patellar. So and leg position because you said she's 90 degrees contracted. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you have your infer patella and super patella, but that's where you're starting kind of a, you're making your incision. There's, you can start at the infer patella, but go la, uh, lateral, so essentially lateral para, uh, excuse me, uh, lateral, para, lateral para patella, or even medial para patella, you can, you can make, different incisions that will give you access to that so uh, this having a 90 contraction doesn't mean you can't nail it that's true that's true i agree thank you what are you going to do in the office like well, what's your plan when because dr pushland said he has here every week are you going to put her in a cast yeah so you know she's in a, she's in a splint now and so we'd probably do weekly cast changes skin checks make sure that they're they're okay radiographs of course yeah check how she's healing that something could be managed with a functional brace? Uh, well, she's, she's not functional, so she doesn't ambulate and she doesn't, she can't move. She doesn't really contract, so, so technically, no. It'd be easier than putting a cast on and off every week. That's true. If it holds it. That's true. Morning. First patient's a 31 year old male presented after a sinkable fall. This left a non displaced coracoid fracture. This was uh, picked up on a, a CT uh, angiogram through allowed PE for this patient. Uh, patient was neurovascularly intact and uh, given a sling for comfort. Next patient's a 78 year old female presenting after a ground level fall approximately four days before presentation. This uh, left distal radius fracture. Neurovascular intact, close reduced, placed into a sugar tongue splint. Next patient's a 53 year old female, status post ground level fall, the left uh, LC1 pelvis fracture. Uh, she was made protected weight bearing uh, with a walker and placed on DVT prophylaxis. What else did you discuss with this 53 year old female with the LC1 pelvis from a ground level fall? Yeah, so I mean, she definitely needs uh, you know, a fr fragility workup. Um, she does have multiple comorbidities and, uh, you know, she was admitted for um, uh, some uh, mass, uh, so, some like abscess that was in her lung that they were treating with IV antibiotics. So, you know, she definitely has a lot of comorbidities that need to be managed. She's not a very healthy person. Mm -hmm. Next patient's a 61 year old female uh, that, that presented with this right hip intertrochanteric fracture you know, of note. Uh, it's kind of unclear when this happened, probably at least a week or so uh, prior to um, presentation. She is non-ambulatory after a CVA approximately two years ago, um, has multiple comorbidities and, uh, you know, barely uh, verbal uh, baseline. So the decision was made to uh, treat this non-operatively. Uh, I also forgot to mention that she does have severe contractures at both the hip uh, and knees bilaterally. So she'll be on DVT prophylaxis. How much pain was she in? So surprisingly, she wasn't in too much pain. Um, you know, she was pretty comfortable just laying there in bed, even though she was contracted. Uh, you know, attempting to examine her resulted in some moderate pain, but it wasn't too severe. So it makes me think this was less acute than, than you know, we may have thought. Thank you.
morning. First case is a 71-year-old female status post fall with a left distal radius fracture. She was uh, neurovascularly intact and taken for a left distal radius or IF. This is a 54-year-old female status post fall with a left distal radius fracture. She initially presented to an outside hospital where she was splinted and then presented to the office several days later. She was neurovascularly intact at this time and was taken for a distal radius or IF. Jeremy, so, just, just a question on this one. This is because this is a pretty straightforward extra articular fracture. Sure. How far out did she present to the office and was there any consideration of a closed reduction and splinting followed by casting? Yeah, very reasonable. Um, I believe she presented three or four days after the injury. Um, you know, obviously if she presented to RED, we would have uh, attempted a closed reduction under a hematomal block. Um, but I believe... Um, whoever saw her in the uh, office felt that it was just a, maybe slightly too long after the injury to attempt a close reduction in the office. And a 54-year-old lady, um, healthy and active, was just taken for the uh, ORAF. This is a 74-year-old female status post-fall on ice with a right distal radius fracture. She was neurovascularly intact. Similar story, was splinted in an outside hospital. Um, she presented to the office uh, a week later um, and then was also taken for a ORF. This is a 61 year old female status post fall six weeks prior. Um, it was initially treated with a closed reduction and casting. I don't have the initial injury films, but this was her um, uh, several weeks after her injury. And then this is her six weeks after her injury with residual dorsal angulation. Um, so it was felt um, at this time to take her for a distal radius uh, corrective osteotomy in ORAF. You know, that, that brings up an excellent point as to what to do in this case, because there are a lot of people that heal in that amount of angulatory deformity that are fine. And you don't yeah. know that at six weeks how they're going to do. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's going to look a little bit weird. Um, you know, some people say it's easier to work through a nascent malunion to fix that, but I mean, that, that is always a dilemma to me. Do you put them in therapy and see where they are in three months and see if they can accept it, or do you jump in and do it? And do you know anything more on this case as to what the actual determination to do the surgery was besides just the way the x-ray looked? No, yeah, I mean, th those were exactly the thoughts um, when discussing this case. Um, you know, she had significant dorsal angulation. Again, she's a healthy, active lady. This is her dominant hand. Um, she was in a little pain still at six weeks. Um, and I think that may have pushed us over the edge to just go ahead and fix it at that point. Jeremy, any indication on why uh, this displaced after closed management? Um. You know, looking at the reduction films, I guess you see like they didn't really get the fuller hook, um, which may have contributed to some of the um, kind of falling off and residual dorsal angulation um, without seeing the exact in injury films. Um, it's hard to say otherwise, but I think that may have been, you know, that with the dorsal comminution there probably both contributed. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at the AP and the lateral, you see there's a bone void dorsally. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, so there's, there's recent literature talking about risk factors for displacement in non-displaced fractures and, and, you know, age greater than 60 and dorsal combination or with independent risk factors for displacement. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And did, last question on this one, did you fill that with some bone graft? And if so, what did you choose? We did not. Um, there is some literature, um, some good studies, um, including one in the journal of wrist surgery in 2015 that showed that these healed without uh, bone grafting. Um, the article that I saw in addition to several others showed 132 um, osteotomies and ORS for distal radius malunions uh, that all healed um, without bone grafting. So we felt comfortable um, even with the void there to just go ahead without the graft. Yeah, I think that's okay. I think you just know it's going to take a little bit longer. And the key yeah. with those studies is you have to make sure you have volar cortical contact. Um, right. Certain fractures where you have to open them up and you don't have that, then, then necessitates the need for graft. Yep, agreed. 
This is an 18 year old male status post hockey check um, with a right proximal pole scaphoid fracture. Uh, he was nerve intact and taken to the OR for a um, scaphoid ORAF via a mini open dorsal approach. This is a 72 year old male status post fall with a right proximal humerus fracture. He was nerve intact, including an axillary nerve. Initial attempts at non-operative management um, were made. Uh, however, at two and a half weeks in the office, he had persistent displacement um, and angulation of his fracture, and he was taken for a proximal humerus ORIF. Any so critique in retrospect, what, what could, yeah, I was going to say, what else could you do differently there operatively? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of options uh, with a displaced surgical neck fracture. Um, you could attempt close reduction, percutaneous pinning. Um, with, in this case, um, when we got him off to sleep, um, uh, he, we were unable to re reduce it close. So that wouldn't have been an option. Uh, you could nail it, um, certainly would be an option as well. Um, but we felt comfortable, or we, we really uh, wanted to open it up um, once we couldn't get it reduced and put a plate on it. What, so you have a surgical neck, right? When it, it collapsed into varus, you put it out where it's supposed to be. So now there's that medial gap you have there. Yeah. So, so what's going to happen now? Could potentially fall again. Back into varus. So right. how do you prevent that with your implant? Uh, usually you put like a calcar screw um, immediately. Uh, if there's and where, some and yeah. where do you put all your screws? And the subchondral bone. Yeah, as far as you can go. Now, yeah. I see a cancellous screw there and proximally. Is that because the bone quality was so poor? Correct. We initially put a cortical screw in, and then when we were manipulating the arm, it kind of all fell apart. <laughs> so uh, we replaced it with a cancellous screw and um, also some locking screws in the shaft. So do you think the, the quality of bone in the head is better than the shaft? No. Uh, I would be very, very cautious of this because it just wants to go fall right back to where it came from. And potentially the screws cutting through the head or the whole, the, or whole plate pulling off. So Serge, do you wait then a little bit longer with this construct to do rehab? Would you start at four weeks instead of you know one or two? I, I would then wait longer, let it heal more. It all get stiff, but they all get to some degree stiff or just use all those screw holes. What approach did you guys use? We did a deltoid splitting lateral approach. I, I don't know, this, this looks like a tough one to me. I would be concerned that you didn't get it all the way out of varus and the plate is not aligned correctly on the head. And what about the screws that would go into the calcar? Did you just not get a bite there or choose not to use them? Uh, can you repeat that? Which screws? Uh, the, the calcar screws, the ones that oh, are yeah. just inferior to those. Did, did they not have a bite or did you just yeah. not to use them? They, they didn't, the one didn't have a bite and there's a lot of comminution right where they enter. Um, and, and we just didn't feel like it was adding much. Jeremy, you mentioned those screws. other, go ahead, Serge. I was going to say the calcar screws are not going to have a bite. They lock into the plate. It's just the question where you put them. Gotcha. And it doesn't matter if there's comminution laterally, right? The, the plate is your lateral portion. You're not, they're not, yeah. not, they're not used like cortical screws. So you could go through comminution and through fracture, but those calcar screws just go up against the subchondral bone at the inferior head. Yeah, understood. I think it's hard to, hard to predict ahead of time, but if you had a fibular strut, it would be a great case to put a fibular strut in there first. Yeah, that makes sense. Jeremy, you mentioned those other alternative treatments, percutaneous pinning, uh, you know, which you couldn't get it reduced, and then also uh, intramedullary nailing. Now that you know what you know about the bone quality, how would those other alternatives fare in that setting? Um, probably not great. Um, you know, knowing all that we know now, it's probably this is the best option we had um, with potentially, you know, kind of the adjustments we talked about. Yeah, and that's the thing to think about is that you're, you know, this is probably your best chance at decent fixation or somewhat terrible fixation. 
Yeah, fair. Next case is a 90 year old female status post fall with a left olecranon fracture. Um, she's a low demand elderly patient with multiple comorbidities. Uh, she was neurovascularly intact, um, with significant bruising about her elbow. She did have some superficial skin tearing, but um, it was not an open fracture. Um, so she was initially placed into a posterior splint uh, for non-operative management. Um, we changed her into a Zemski just so we could do um, wound checks while she was in the hospital. Um, and her skin was healing appropriately before she left. Jeremy, just one more comment on that proximal humerus. You know, when, when that locking plate first came out, the demonstration they had, they, they would put the plate against an apple and fill all the screws and you couldn't get the apple off the plate. So all those screws are divergent, convergent, and um, you get fixation with the screws, even in crappy bone, just by filling yeah. the entire head. Yeah. So, um, and that's easy. You're there, just put them all in. Makes sense. Even with that though, Jeremy, I mean, what's, what's the cutout rate? typically been reported for these locking proximal humerus plates. I've seen like 15%. Yeah, as high as 20%. Yeah. Uh, as an 81 year old female stats post fall with this right proximal humerus fracture, she was nervously intact, including the axillary nerve and was made non weight bearing in a cuff and collar sling. Do you know of uh... Any recent humeral shaft studies showing which fractures have the highest nine union and, and um, complication rates? Proximal third. Yeah. And this one's, I know she's 81, probably low demand. It's just that looks like it's going to go on to a non union potentially. Yeah, it's certainly, certainly one to watch closely. Morning. First patient is a 51 year old gentleman who fell on the ice this weekend and sustained this left humeral, sorry, right humeral shaft fracture. He was neurovascularly intact. He was closed reduced and placed into a coaptation cuff and collar. Next patient is a 53 year old female who slipped and fell down some icy stairs outside her home and sustained this left distal radius fracture. She was closed reduced and placed into a sugar tongue splint. Next patient is a uh, newborn male who had shoulder dystocia and difficulty um, evacuating from the, the mother um, and sustained this left humeral shaft fracture. <laughs> Birth, yes. Um, uh, he was grossly neurovascularly attacked and uh, his uh, sleeve was pinned across his chest. Anna, were the light posts, <laughs> were the light posts not functioning? Is that why they couldn't evacuate? <laughs> um, hey, so obviously in the order, put these fractures in order of uh, commonality uh, with a, um, a birth trauma, clavicle fracture, humeral shaft fracture, supracondylar fracture. Clavicle, humerus, supracondylar is pretty rare with birth. Yeah, but it can happen and you have to look for physial separation. So if it looks like an elbow dislocation on an x-ray, it's a physial separation. Good. Uh, this next patient is an unfortunate kid who was running down the stairs, slipped and fell, and then fell over the edge and sustained bilateral distal radius fractures, uh, left worse than right. He was neurovascularly intact, sedated, and closed reduced in place into uh, the right side was a um, AP slab so that he could uh, do self hygiene, and then left was placed into a sugar tongue splint. morning. Uh, first patient's a seven-year-old male who fell and sustained a right supracondylar humerus fracture, uh, type two. It's neurovascular intact and taken for right elbow CRPP. 
is a 12 year old. What would happen if you left that one alone and treated it non-operatively? Uh, well, some people will certainly do. And there have been studies showing similar outcomes. Uh, I know that some people will even try a, like a closed reduction prior to casting. Well, what would, what would happen if you just left it like that and just let it heal? What would, what would they look like in three months or six months? Well, I think it would heal fine. And I mean, the anterior humeral line still, you know, intersects the cavitellum. So I think that you might have a very small loss in uh, flexion, but I think you'd still have a pretty normal range of motion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's important to remember these all, these all heal fine. Right. So it's all just about talking to the parents and uh, kind of reading the parents and seeing, so you're, you're effectively changing their arc of motion, I guess you could argue. Right. So they're losing, they're losing some uh, flexion, right. And they're gaining some extension into hyper extension. Uh, and sometimes that's not what you want. Say if you have a, somebody who's really into upper extremity weight bearing uh, and doing a lot of gymnastics and now they, hyperextend 10 degrees, uh, when they do their, you know, when they do their sport. Um, and then, yeah, there is some arguable debatable literature out there, right. That we went through for our journal club last time for do some of these actually remodel a little bit, you know, the old dogma was that there's no really remodeling of, uh, extension, but there is some data out there that would argue that perhaps there is some uh, you know, some remodeling. So I think it's just what your desired outcome and range of motion is. I think that, yeah, there's always going to be a complication from surgery, but the risks are pretty low for a closed reduction of percutaneous pinning for, for this. So, but it's important to remember those points. There's a 12 year old male who uh, fell at a trampoline center and has a left tibia and fibula shaft fractures. He was nervously intact as a closed injury. He was placed into a long leg cast and wedged to uh, adjust the alignment. There's a 20 year old male who was checked into the boards in a hockey game and had a acute on chronic uh, left middle third clavicle fracture. He had a prior fracture treated non-operatively eight years ago. Uh, his skin was intact. There's no tenting and he was neurovascularly intact. Um, he's mid season right now. He's going to follow up and have a discussion about whether or not to treat this operatively. Um, but we were leaning towards fixing it. When you say acute on chronic eight years old, uh, is there x-rays that show it wasn't healed? No, it, it, was, it was healed. Sorry. Acute on healed. The healed in that with the tenting and the... He, he did have a bump there but not not as significant as from this injury and he said he he did fine it the first time why are you leaning towards surgery the second time so uh, we were leaning towards surgery for this one because of the, the comminution and z deformity and shortening and i don't know it if someone's mid-season hockey, do you let them go back and play and then fix it later? Or you think he could play? He's not playing with that. Right. That hurts. When you get checked into the boards, it's kind of. It's kind of... I've, ne I've never been checked into the boards before, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a 75 year old female who is in a motor vehicle accident, sustained this left humeral shaft fracture. Um, was initially plays into a coaptation splint. Um, we sent her out. I, I, we were planning to fix it. I don't, I don't know if anyone else presented this one. I was gone last week. But I uh, think that this <laughs> will not be easy to treat in a functional brace. Her radial nerve is intact. This is a 31-year-old male uh, who punched a cop and had a right small finger metacarpal base fracture. Was placed into AP slabs. This is a 50 year old female who was pulling her family dog off of her daughter's arm and was bit, sustaining a left ring finger, uh, DIP fracture dislocation, partial amputation, and a small finger open tough fracture. The 
tuft was washed out and nail bed was repaired for the ring finger the only thing still uh, attaching her finger to the fingertip was her FTP tendon. And uh, after a thorough discussion, the decision was made to complete the amputation, uh, IND, uh, antibiotics, and uh, plan for wound coverage at a later date. This is a 64-year-old male who was found down uh, extremely hyperglycemic at his group home and sustained this C6 and 7 bridging osteophyte fracture. He was narrow intact and did not seem to have any involvement beyond that osteophyte. It's treated non-operatively in a hard uh, C collar. This is an 85 year old female status post fall with a right basic cervical femoral neck fracture was medically optimized and taken for a right hip intramedullary nail. This is a 57-year-old male who was in a motor vehicle accident and sustained a right tibial plateau fracture and a right posterior glenoid rim fracture. Uh, he does not think that his shoulder was dislocated in the accident, but seems like it is certainly possible. He was nerve action intact in both extremities. He was taken for a right tibial plateau, ORAF and bone grafting. Um, we're planning to treat the shoulder non-operatively with the sling and then uh, therapy. You don't happen to have contralateral films, do you? The, of the, on that of looks the a knee. little wide. It, looks, it might yeah. be him. It looks, no, it definitely looks wide. We don't have contralateral films, but uh, I think that a lot of the, I don't think that this is what his knee normally looks like. And this was, uh, it was extremely comminuted at the articular surface. And I think he's headed towards a, a total knee in the not too distant future. How was his lateral meniscus? Uh, we had to repair the lateral meniscus. But when you were done, did it look good? The meniscus? Yeah. It looked okay. It wasn't, it was not a complex tear. It's um, vertical. You might be surprised how well he does. I hope I mean, so. You say he's headed towards a total knee. I, I would argue maybe not. I hope so. I mean, not for a long time. Something's gonna, it's not gonna collapse real bad, real quick. Yeah. First patient is a 53 year old female who uh, tripped on some stairs and fell, twisting her left ankle. She has this bimal equivalent ankle fracture. Um, you can see the tail is shifting on the mortise view, but a stress view was obtained, which confirmed this. Uh, she was splinted and she'll follow up in office for further management. Uh, next is a 15 year old male that was playing basketball when he fell on his uh, left wrist. He has this distal radius fracture. He was closed, reduced, put in a sugar tongue splint. Um, next is a 10 year old female who uh, twisted her right ankle at recess. Um, was sent in with this right triplane ankle fracture. Um, she was put in a long leg bivalve uh, cast and a uh, CAT scan was obtained. Oh. Showed pretty significant displacement of that anterior piece. Uh, a discussion was had with uh, the parents and they decided to follow up in the office for further planning. They decided to go to CHOP. So they were supposed to come back and see me, didn't show. And then uh, we were trying to get them on the schedule and they decided they wanted to go somewhere else. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, first patient, 61 year old male, uh, working to clean the snow over the weekend. He we fell off some steps and had this displaced left on neck fracture. Uh, of note, he does smoke half pack per day and three years ago had a fall and non displaced right from an neck fracture. I'll show you what James Cruz. He was taken uh, for a left uh, total hip arthroplasty. Uh, he'll undergo a fragility fracture workup given his two uh, front neck fractures. You have one the first time, Dan? Uh, I, I didn't look to see if he did. I don't think so. I think his femoral cortices look pretty good, but 61 years old and both femoral necks are broken already. It's something weird. Uh, next patient is a right-hand dominant 61-year-old uh, female uh, who had a crush injury, uh, suffered a uh, tuft and a uh, comminuted P1 fracture of her index finger. Uh, uh, she treated with an external fixator of her index finger. Uh, next patient is a right-hand dominant 43-year-old uh, man who suffered a saw injury, uh, has open uh, thumb P1 fracture. He was initially irrigated, uh, loosely closed and given antibiotics. Uh, he had a laceration to his EPL. Uh, he was taken back uh, for a pinning of his P1 fracture. At the time of the operation, we found that that fracture had completed itself, and then we repaired uh, the EPL uh, directly. Next patient's a right-hand dominant 17-year-old. Uh, Dan. Piece. Yep. So was there any consideration of pinning it or I mean, uh, plating it since it was open already and you're looking at everything? Uh, yeah, we, we, we thought both options, but um, this elected to, to pin it. But we thought about, uh, you know, plating and then I'll, I'll even potentially bone grafting it. But, you know, we were able to uh, get a good reduction, clean up the bone edges and just pinned it and it felt stable. And but you got a not. primary repair of the tendon? We did, yep. Okay. Our next patient is a right-hand dominant 17-year-old girl who fell while snowboarding, had uh, third and fourth uh, metacarpal shaft fractures. Uh, there was some, uh, on, on a clinical exam, there wasn't a concern for a rotational uh, abnormality and the length appeared uh, to be appropriate. However, the, the concern is that these would shorten uh, with time. Uh, so the patient was taken for an open reduction and pinning with uh, K-wires. Uh, next patient's right-hand dominant, 33-year-old. Another man. option for, for fixation there. You're going to do an open yeah. reduction. Yeah, so you, you could uh, use screws in a plate. Uh, other, it's just a surgeon's preference, use K-wires instead of those other options for fix, fixing this fracture. Uh, next patient's uh, writing down a 33-year-old male, size was fall, presented uh, with a right index finger dislocation, uh, metacarpal MCP dislocation, uh, a non-displaced distal radius fracture, and a radial shaft fracture. Uh, there was a volar uh, wound uh, in the location of the hand where the index uh, metacarpal fracture, uh, uh, sorry, an index metacarpal dislocation was, this is his radius. He was taken for an open reduction of his uh, index finger MCP uh, and then uh, ORAF of his uh, radius. Yeah, and which way did you approach the MCP dislocation? Uh, we, did, we did a volar uh, intraop. We found that the volar plate uh, in combination with the flexor tendon and the uh, superficial transverse metacarpal ligament is kind of blocking our reduction. Do you think you could have got a lag screw that? Uh, could, could someone say that again? Do you think you could have got a lag screw through that just to compress it a little bit more? Or? Um, we, you know, I think it was uh, kind of a sh uh, short oblique. It might be impossible, but we compressed to the plate. Um, um, and we were kind of satisfied with that compression. But, you know, I think the angle would have been tough. Yeah, I think it'd be fine. Uh, Dan, why did why did we go volar for the index finger? Uh, he he had a, a uh, uh, well, it, it's a dorsal. 
you know, this location. So um, usually the void plate is going to be the um, structure that could be blocking it, uh, blocking it so they get access there. So typically it's a lot easier just to go dorsal, uh, even with the dorsal dislocation, but it, we went volar because there was a, it, was a, it was already open there. Yeah, it was, yeah. And what structure do you have to worry about when you do your volar approach to the MCP joint, especially the index digit? Uh, do you have to worry about your, you know, common digital nerves, your nerve astral bundles? Which nerves specifically? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So it's going to be the radial side of that digital nerve. It's going to cross right over the level of the metacarpal head. And I've almost gotten burned before. It's right underneath the skin. So you got to be looking for it right away. How do you assess for stability afterwards? Because these, these joints aren't really inherently stable. And any thought to pinning it? Or uh, was it just you know not necessary? Uh, I think I think it, you know we we took it through a, a range of motion uh, afterwards, and it, it seemed uh, not a one of some blocks. You know we after we we started initially by open reducing and then proceeded to uh, do the radius, um, and then we we we, we reassessed at the end of the case it was still still stable. Our next patient is a twenty nine year old male. He was in an MVC and had this uh, right distal radius fracture. Uh, as you can see, he had like uh, associated uh, dislocation of his uh, carpus uh, involving the styloid and a dorsal portion of the distal radius there. He underwent a closed reduction and a CAT scan was obtained. What do you know with uh, axial cuts? He was uh, nerve vascularly intact. He was taken for a disarrayous uh, ORF with fragment specific uh, fixation. It's a good job. That was a nasty little injury. Yes, this is the, the TriMed system uh, and it worked uh, really nice. I mean, that, that's exactly how I would have done it. That's extremely complicated. My only question is, is that radial plate high enough? Because your radial fragment is very, very small. Are you sure you captured it with your plate there? Uh, I think we, we definitely I think we definitely captured it. Um, the, the plate's certainly sitting where it needs to sit. You can't get any more distal with that. I think that's an awesome job. I agree. Yeah, you see on that second view how it, the fragment almost looks like it's slightly older relative to that plate. It's, I, it's I, think, I think they still got it. Nice. Uh, next patient is a right-hand dominant, 39-year-old uh, male, uh, Saspo's fall, presented with his right uh, distal humerus fracture, intraticular bicondylar. Uh, he was nervous, nerve nervously intact. He was taken to the opera room for open reduction and fixation. Next patient is a right hand dominant 58 year old female, Saswell's fall, a left distal humerus uh, fracture. Uh, 30 years ago, she had a MVC uh, and had a, a comminuted distal humerus fracture that was treated uh, in traction and with external fixation. Uh, and she developed this uh, malunion of her distal humerus. Additionally, at that time, she had a radial nerve uh, palsy uh, that required uh, tendon transfers. Uh, she had been functional for 30 years despite uh, limited um, mobility and function in this upper extremity. However, she fell and had this non-displaced, uh, this transverse distal humerus fracture. Initially, it was uh, attempted to be treated conservatively. However, she ended up displacing, uh, having symptomatic crepitus. Um, she was taken to the operating room for her production fixation, uh, where we just uh, fix her back to her previous um, deformity.
So next patient is a right hand down, 59 year old female, uh, status was MVC, uh, presented with the left open uh, humerus fracture, uh, in addition to a left uh, open elbow dislocation. Uh, she has significant uh, soft tissue uh, injuries uh, anteriorly uh, over the shoulder uh, and then medial and lateral around her elbow. Uh, she was provisionally splinted uh, and her, she, her radial nerve was out. Um, she had antibiotics and took her to the OR initially for irrigation debridement of her wounds and ORIF of her uh, humerus uh, by a posterior approach. We visualized the radial nerve and it was attacked without any apparent uh, injury. Uh, she was uh, splinted uh, and she's undergoing further evaluation for her elbow in addition to plastics coverage for her wound. Uh, so she had arthrotomy, the, she had arthrotomy at the time say. of uh, injury and then uh, interop, we noticed that she had instability at the elbow when manipulating it. Uh, she definitely has uh, her LCL on the lateral side is torn. Uh, we got a CAT scan of her elbow to see if there's any bony injury there. And there wasn't. Uh, she's going back to the OR today for examination and anesthesia, LCL repair. Well, there was a little fleck off the coronoid. You could obviously couldn't examine the elbow until it was fixed, until the humerus was fixed. Once the humerus was fixed, uh, it was clear that the elbow was unstable. Were you, uh, did you preemptively leave a little room for uh, like an internal joint stabilizer in there? I, I think be... I did, using like internal joint stabilizer is like a, an option. But if you had, if you use that plate and you put the screws across the entire capitellum, you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't have been able to put that joint stabilizer. That's just a coincidence. No, it's yeah, just a coincidence. Is. We talked about it, but uh, we're, we're probably just going to use a suture anchor and uh, left room for the suture anchor. There's plenty of fixation distal, so I don't usually go too long with those screws anyways, just so I don't want to mess with ever being close to the joint. Did you consider like fixing it at that time? Well, we know we're, we knew we were going back, and that was at the that was sort of at the end of the case. We knew we were going back to, to wash her out again, and uh, so I decided just to wait. I got you. It, it, Carlos, if you are going to do a suture uh, anchor, you, you may want to consider a uh, internal brace on top of it as well, just in case there's a lot of you know, manipulation with that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, next patient, a uh, patient's been previously presented. It's a right hand dominant uh, 59 year old female who fell, had a uh, complex shoulder dislocation. Uh, she initially uh, was reduced uh, and was uh, discharged. However, she subsequently uh, returned uh, due to a volume pain and loss of function in her right upper extremity. Uh, she had a stroke workup and uh, full evaluation when she be presented and was concerned that she had some sort of uh, plexopathy. Um, she returned to the office about two weeks later, uh, got repeat x-rays and her virtual rosy completely displaced. Uh, she was taken to the operating room for an open reduction internal fixation of the tuberosity piece. How did you approach that one? Uh, we did a, a deltoid split. Um, and then uh, we were able to uh, find that piece uh, and pull it back. Um, luckily, it wasn't uh, very retracted. And we were able to get a good reduction. Um, you know, the Italian preference was to use these uh, Kinsella screws with washers and they had great bite. Uh, and then we uh, did like a pull, like a, a stitch to the cuff and then tied it down to that cortical screw you see distally the neck. One option is you can also use a plate as well and tie that tied into the plate. But her bone was, was pretty good. Next patient is a right hand dominant 77 year female who fell, had this displaced proximal humerus fracture. Uh, she uh, was neurovascularly intact. She initially was taken for a closed reduction for continuous pinning. Um, and this uh, went well. However, two weeks, uh, she had pin migration and displacement of her fracture. Uh, she was taken, uh, had those pins removed, and had a, a trial period of non-operative treatment. However, she continued to have uh, 
pain, uh, instability, and loss of function in her arm. And so she was uh, obtained a CAT scan to further delineate uh, her, where her fracture was uh, for operative planning. For her, uh, that retained uh, broken pin was. What was the CAT scan for the fracture or for arthroplasty preparation? Uh, arthroplasty preparation. So the plan was to uh, do a reverse uh, total shoulder. What, what? And were those the German, just to go back to the pins real quick, were those fully threaded pins or terminally threaded pins or smooth pins? And were they bent outside the skin? Uh, they're full, fully threaded pins. And I think they, they, you cut them right uh, below the skin. Now, the CT scan, what about the CT scan helps you with the arthroplasty or reverse? It scanned the idea about the glenoid and planning. Uh, you know, Is that getting... typical pre-op for a... Uh, reverse for a uh, after fracture. There's something wrong with the glenoid from the dislocation you're worried about. Uh, it's for uh, uh, it's for for templating the glenoid, so you know the version uh, going into the case. Also, the glenoid bone stock. Um, you know, you're right. Typically, we were worry more about that with prolonged arthritis, where they have abnormal glenoid wear, but it's still helpful to uh, to use this blueprint software for templating and patient. They create patient specific instrumentation that we use in the in the operating room. When she uh, when she had her original fracture, was there a CAT scan obtained then or no? No. Uh, no. So. no yeah, because usually with the fracture, a lot of times you have the the CAT scan is done because of the original fracture. I just didn't know if she had a one to begin with can you use an old cat scan jamie for the templating or does that have to be a specific cat scan uh it just has to be a cat scan with you red so it can be an old one all right thank you I mean, first patient is 44 year old male, status was MVC, who came with left type 3 open distal tibia fracture and left uh, perilunate dislocation. Uh, initially, he was taken to the OR for tibia IND and X fix placement, uh, as well as uh, risk loss reduction and splinting. He was also had like excessive laceration over the uh, former, that forearm that was IND and closed. The patients came back to the OR uh, for left tibia open reduction and internal fixation and wrist uh, open reduction. And speed. Uh, next patient is 72 year old male, status was fall uh, with uh, left uh, B2 periprosthetic femur fracture. Uh, patients was indicated for uh, left hip revision hemi arthroplasty. Next patient is 56 year old female status was fall uh, with left femoral neck fracture. Patients uh, uh, sustained a femoral shaft fracture 20 years prior presentation and she was fixed with the uh, intramedullary nail. The decision was made to take the patients to the OR uh, for left femoral removal of intramedullary nail and uh, total hip arthroplasty. Next patient is 68 year old female status post fall with left distal tibia fracture. My patient was taken to the OR for left tibia open reduction and internal fixation. Next patient is 91 year old male status post fall with uh, right hip uh, basic cervical neck fracture. The patient was taken to the OR for right hip intramedullary nailing. Uh, next patient is 34 year old female status post pedestrian shock uh, who came to the hospital with right open uh, femoral shaft fracture. 
and the patient was taken to the OR for uh, right femoral IND and intramedial RNA. Uh, next patient is 67 year old. Can you go back one? What? So what nailed so, that? Yeah, so so that that was a difficult case. So we start the case uh, with the piriformis entry rimming. Uh, we put guide wire and we start rimming the isthmus. And with the first rimmer, we got difficulty to go through the isthmus with nine millimeter rimmers. So we spent like twenty minutes rimming the isthmus with the smallest one. So finally, we go up until the ten millimeters. So we couldn't place the piriformis entry nail because the smallest size is 10. So we decided to use uh, adolescent nail, which unfortunately is a, a trochanteric entry nail or lateral entry nail. Uh, during the case, we placed this nail, we replaced them with the longer one, but with the longer one, there's like prominence and the patient was small so we couldn't accept that so we did make the decision to put this shortest nail and a little bit deeper and we fix this there, with a little yeah. valgus there is a uh, this uh, i'm assuming you used the uh, 10 fan nail first the performance yeah we were trying nail. but this the smallest one was 10 millimeters but wide and just there is a the synthes has their performance recon nail that's a nine millimeter smallest. That's in, that's in house if you ever need it again. Yeah, yeah I think it's going to be right fine, but we almost got the 10 reamer stuck in there. And I just did not want to ream anymore. Yeah. It just looks a little about this. Next patient is 67 year old female, status was full with a left ankle trimal fracture. Cuts can also obtain, and patient was taken to the OR for left ankle open reduction and internal sensation. Next patient is 77 year old male, status was full with right hip IT fracture. Patient was taken to the OR for right hip IM nail. Next patient is 51 year old male, status was full with left ankle trimal, fra trimal fracture. Patients was taken to the OR for left ankle open reduction and internal fixation. Thank you. That's all cases for today.